I better go very easy here because um, not only is he certainly the best snooker historian I've ever met in my life, he's my mate. So, uh, Neil, Neil Folds, I'm going to ask a couple of quick questions. This is about tour mates, really, all the people that you played with over the years on tour. Most likely to turn up late. I think, well, nowadays, Neil Robertson, definitely. In, in my day, uh, I think Nolsey, Tony Knowles turned up late once without any trousers which is probably a quite a good double act, isn't it? He had a, the waistcoat, left his trousers at home, and he was late. Apart from that, he was prepared very well. The biggest eater? Biggest eater, Tony Drago is not very, very far from me. He can put the food away, and he always could. So he was, uh, to be honest, I was up there. But the biggest of all, Les Dodd, who won Slimmer of the Year, so he had a good bit of condition to go with there. He, he used to stay down at breakfast. If it was a buffet breakfast, he'd come in and join everyone and be there the whole morning. Last at the bar? Last at the bar, that's a good one. There's a few candidates for that. I think that the guy that was sitting in this chair before me would, would have been Dean O'Kane. I think he, he can drink a glass of red wine into the small hours with a long cigar, can Dean. So he would probably qualify in that score. Worst person to sit next to on a long haul flight? Well, there's two on that one. One is Mr. Drago again, who seems to fit up into every category. And the other one was uh, Peter Ebsen. He's one of those annoying guys that when a plane lands, he starts clapping. You always wonder why people do that. He's one of those. So he's not great. Yeah, I mean, it's not a fluke he's landed, is it? I mean, he does it for a job, the bloke. You don't need a round of applause, does he, the captain? You'd like to think so, wouldn't you? I mean, I must admit, there's one or two players I'm not going to name who used to sit on a long-haul flight and you think that before the plane's actually taken off, you've run out of things to say to them. Uh, <laughs> suffer from balding or grey denial? Hang on a minute. Uh, what's that? Balding or grey denial? Um, all I know is I've come here this, this week uh, end and I'm seeing... All these players with going greyer and with less hair, but there's one or two that seem to have more hair, which I don't really understand how that works. More hair than they're playing, they now they're seniors. Um, yeah, um, there's there's a few that fit that category. Me, I think probably. Best dressed. Best dressed. There's a good one. Um, I think I tell you, he was a very very tidy, well dressed man. Alan McManus. I've always noticed that. He used to go to the venue. He was neatly, tidily placed there. He was very well dressed. Uh, who else? Don't know really. Um, Nolsey, Tony Knowles. He used to do quite well with the women, you know. Still does, no doubt. But uh, he used to dress dress for the part as well. What about worst dressed? Worst dressed. I reckon Mark Williams is, has got that absolutely nailed. Um, they made it more casual a few years ago where the players could, could not wear bow ties and open neck shirt and I think they had to change it back because he kind of abused it a bit. Um, most unusual place you've ever played snooker and we've had some, we've had the QE2 and we had an oil rig and an uneven floor with Willy and stuff like that so what about yourself? Played outdoors at once in an exhibition, which was in Dubai. Only a couple of frames. There was a little bit of sand and a bit of a wind blowing, and it was a bit like a golfer. You had to allow for the wind on certain shots. That's the only time I've ever played anywhere like that, to be honest with you. First car. First car was a Triumph Toledo. It cost me 200 quid. Um, managed to have a, an accident, and it bent the axle, but sold it in the auctions the next day, which I probably shouldn't have done, really. It was light blue, and it was, and it, well, I was proud of it at the time until I wrapped it. Biggest joker and practical joker? Don't know. There's a few candidates again for that, but the one I always like is Willie Thorne, who's an old friend of mine. And his favourite one is uh, who was the best player who came into the room before, before I walked in? And then when John Parrott's answers, that was all of us, Willie. <laughs> Slowest opponent. Slowest opponent? Well, um, I think the grinder, who might be, I'll say it quietly because he could be anywhere here, Cliff Thorne, but he wasn't the quickest. But I played a fella called Robbie Foldvari, who beat me in a ranking event, um, who, an Australian guy who, to be honest, I said probably a little bit too much about after the game. I, I said it was, you know, that he, he was too slow and it was a disgrace. And I apologise, Robbie, if you're looking at that. I shouldn't have said all that. But you are the slowest player I've ever played against. And he held most of the records in that department. So he was the king of the slow players. And the biggest moaner? Biggest moaner? Me, probably, to me dad after matches. I moaned about everything there was to moan about. The table, the conditions, bad luck, the queue, everything. So I'd say, I have to, after slating everyone else, I have to put myself in biggest moan of the lot, me. And your dad said, but son, the other player was on the same table. He did say that, but then who listens to their dad when you've got the hum? He was the one person I could vent all my annoyance out. And, but sometimes after matches, there was long inquiries. And uh, you know, looking back, you know, it was only a game. But at the time, it felt like it was the world. So maybe there's something in that, isn't there? As you get older, you realise bigger things go on in the world than someone getting a fluke against you in a match. Neil Folds, brilliant stuff.